Welcome to this episode of the Becoming a Billionaire Show. Today's guest is Blair Rachel Jones, and we had her husband on the show recently, Garen Jones, who had a bunch of epic one-liners and, and amazing things. <laughs> and I love being able to interview the couple uh. separately because then I can get the other side of every story. And for my personal, like, selfful reasons, is to figure out what makes you two so amazing. Because mm -hmm. when I when I interact with like my various friend circles, I'm always like, okay, m a lot of relationships that I see end up like falling apart, yeah. whatever, whatever. But there's a few that I'm like, okay, this is like the relationships yeah. that I want to look at. So yeah. I just mentioned like Ajit and Nita, mm, and yeah. they uh, Nita has just recently been on the show as well. Yeah, and they're dear friends of mine, and they're also like couple goals. Yeah, and then you guys are like couple goals. <laughs> so I've got like a few of these. So yeah. when I get the opportunity to interview both sides and kind of talk about the relationship dynamics, yeah. and I just can just learn so much from the stories and, and more than anything, like the energies yeah. of how you speak about each other and getting to understand like where you came from yeah. and like who you really are. And then at some point in that intersection of like, when did you meet? Cause I've got yeah. his side of that yeah. story. So I don't have your side yeah. of that story. And there's just so much juiciness in there. And I have questions. I have a lot of questions about all this. So I'm ready to get us going, if you were to describe why you are amazing in like a sentence or two, to a random stranger, a la me, what would that sentence or two be? Like, what makes you incredible? I think that I have lived on both ends of the spectrum, very humbly. I was humbly broke <laughs> and I humbly have done well. And uh, on both sides of the spectrum, you would never know that I was broke and on the other side of the spectrum you probably wouldn't ever guess that we have done fairly well and i feel like um i enjoy my story because it just gave me more more ways to relate to more people mm -hmm. so tell me about that uh let me let me back up even further and say what did your parents do my dad was in the union, so he was a bricklayer for 40 years. And my mom uh, put herself through nursing school. Uh, and so she was a registered nurse for and still is today. So for okay. 40 plus years. And where did you grow up? I grew up in a tiny town in Minnesota. It's called Two Harbors. There's mm -hmm. 3,000 people. Uh, and it's named Two Harbors because it has two porting harbors. Was it Lake Superior? On Lake Superior, yeah. Yeah, I was born in Shakopee. What's ah, up? That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Spent a lot of time in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many years. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so that makes more sense. Yeah. The, your whole look now makes sense to me. You're like a lived in California, Minnesota native. There's yeah. A specific look to that. Yeah. So I grew up on a farm. So we milk cows before we went to school. Uh, my dad built a tiny little shed at the end of our driveway because the windshield was so cold that if you're outside for too long, you get frostbite. Uh, I rode my horse to school. Whoa. I rode my snowmobile to school. So I got, I could drive a tractor at 14. So Oh my gosh, There's I have so many more questions opening up now. I was in 4-H and FFA, if you know what that is, Future yeah. Farmers of America. That's so. a huge thing here in Texas. Yeah. Huge deal. Yep. So. Yeah, you must be very popular amongst the locals here. <laughs> I don't know. I just, rare, yeah, my, my, the best thing hands down my parents ever did was, um, I believe was get me a horse because that's how I understood responsibility and chores. And growing up on a farm, I value hard work and it was not, it was nothing of being rewarded. It's just what we did. Like, this is what we do. Like mm -hmm. there was no, I didn't get allowance for it. I didn't like that. That is just what we did. And you didn't ask questions. You loved it. You hated it. It's just what we did. Got it. There's usually like two mentalities of people that grow up in these small towns, right? Mm -hmm. One mentality is, oh my gosh, I have to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And the second mentality is, oh my gosh, I love it so much. I'm going to stay here forever. Mm -hmm. Are you one of those two or a third? I had to get out of there. Okay. Yeah, it was, um, I remember growing up, I would ask my mom, like, I just, 
the things that I love to do, she, she would always tell me, she's like, you, you don't belong here. Like, she's like, I don't know how you get these interests or these things that you want to go or like ever, growing up on a farm never made sense to me. So from like really early on, and I was never exposed to a lot, like we didn't travel much. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I just knew that that was not for me, <laughs> but it was not for me, but I did it and I humbly did it. So great. What was the it. next step? Where did you go? Did you just, did you find a way to get to college afterwards? Yes. Yeah, so sports was my outlet. So mm -hmm. it's the one thing I was good at and it was the one thing that I knew would get me out of there. So I got a scholarship to go play volleyball in college. And then I actually played volleyball for a little bit in Italy. Uh, semi-pro, nothing that cool, but you got $400 a month to be there and they paid for your room and board. So I was like, I was living the high life. So, um, and it was my one chance to get out of the country for a little bit. So it was nothing to write home about, but, um, I got to go see a lot of cool things for a little while at 22. So that was pretty neat. Yeah. 22 year old woman living in Italy as an amateur semi-pro athlete. Yeah. Sounds like an amazing time. Yeah. Yeah. Where in Italy did you go? It was not that cool. Again, it was Bologna, Italy, but still it was Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, but from there, after I was done playing, I got to go backpack a little bit. So I got to go to Rome. Uh, I went to Amsterdam, Croatia. So got to visit some really cool things. Got to go to London, got to go to Paris. Uh, so again, just that one opportunity to go play in a really small town for a little bit and then got to go hop around and go see the con the uh yeah different countries the world the world at yeah. 22 was pretty neat yeah 22 year old girl from minnesota grew yeah. up on a farm yeah semi-pro volleyball player this this is getting pretty epic pretty fast <laughs> yeah it was it was new it was a cool opportunity yes so then i'm gonna i'm gonna jump forward and we're gonna tarantino it we're gonna come yep. back to this coming back jumping forward to like now mm -hmm. what's your like we're in a pretty epic setting yep. we're in a pretty epic scenario yeah you've got six month old nine month old seven eight, seven month old right baby between, soul yep. right outside and she is like we uh, hopefully at some point she comes in we can show her on camera because she is one of the most beautiful babies i've ever seen she's cute she is a mix of so many amazing mm -hmm. genetics it's incredible mm -hmm. what's your dream or like your vision now for your life like what's the what do you feel like you are becoming or stepping into a great question uh i'm very much exploring that right now so this is why this is why it's a really fascinating question um and how do you go about that how do you go about like creating that vision for yourself now having a baby changed a lot i mean for probably multiple reasons and also it was the point in time i mean I, I've, I've worked so long to survive like it was like working was not a means to an end. It was a means to survive for me. Um, the other part of my story is I actually moved out when I was 16. So I emancipated myself. So in the state of Minnesota, I went to court in front of a judge and asked to legally divorce my parents so I could be seen as an adult at 16 versus having to be 18. So I could make, I can move out and make my own decisions. And I was granted that. And so, um, at very at 16 is when my life really started. And so, um, from 16 all the way until I had soul when I was 32, that's our baby. And, um, I never really stopped. Like it was just like on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. Um, and then when I had her, all of a sudden I like reevaluated life. And so I don't, I don't know how far we want to get into this, but about soul is four days old and Garen went downstairs for a meeting and he was on this zoom meeting. And I remember thinking, I was like, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to reincarnate with Garen again. I don't know if I'm going to reincarnate with Soul again. And in that moment, I was like, I want to spend as much time and quality time with these two humans as mm. humanly possible. And so my whole life really kind of shifted in that moment of like, none of this stuff actually matters. And to me, what actually matters is my people, which are Soul and Garen, and what kind of life, what kind of memories and traditions are we going to do together? And I went downstairs and I never do this. I never, ever interrupt him when he's, pod I try not, like when he's podcasting, when he's working, like 
he's very passionate about it. And I knocked on the door and I was standing outside the door holding our four day old baby. And I started crying and I was like, I need you to come sit with me. And I, that's when I was like, I am so in love with you. I'm so in love with this life. And I feel like I'm this time we're never going to get back. So I, I just, I need you to be here for a second. And ever since that moment, I really looked at my life a lot differently. Like what, what is the point of all this stuff? And um, I like a lot of money because it, to me, money means that I have a lot more options, and that means that we can create a lot more experiences and adventures in this world. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that, how to work less, make more. Maybe that's the American dream now. But um, so that's that's where I'm at. So I don't have an exact answer for you, but that's what I'm. That's what I'm flirting with in the moment incredible incredible so i've got a few layers to go through here mm -hmm. number one at what point so if we if we back up to when you and garen came into each other's lives mm -hmm. right i i want to figure out and kind of deconstruct how you got to this moment of such a deep love mm -hmm. right with soul day four right mm -hmm. so at did you have some unhealthy relationships before Garen? I'm pretty sure all of them. <laughs> so, I mean, physically, uh, mentally, substance abuse. I mean, I kind of I kind of checked them all off the list. Got it. And so, um, yeah, went down, went down the line basically. And if I back up even further, why did you emancipate at 16? Because that was the relationship my parents had. So my dad and he will openly share this, is a functioning alcoholic. Um, my mom at the time, my mom is in a, such a great place right now. Um, but at the time she was um, really battling with, she was with prescription drugs. And then you throw a really opinionated 16 year old in there. It was kind of the perfect, perfect recipe for catastrophe. It was a lot of chaos. Um, my mom and I had gotten in a few domestic arguments and so she actually went to jail because she had pulled a knife on me she actually cut my dad and so then the ambulance had to come and then when we wrote the police report it kind of came out of what happened so my dad was drunk my mom was high then there's a knife someone gets cut and then you have this 16 year old living in the house and then that's actually when one of the police officers said hey this is the third time we've been out here. Did you know that you can, you have options? And I was like, what are these options? And he's like, I would really look into emancipation if I was you. And I didn't even, I never even knew what it was. I had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And he had kind of nudged me in that direction. And then from there, when I did my research, then I was able to put, I guess, my own case together and then go to court. And then that's how it all kind of came to be. Uh, so I only knew domestic in unhealthy relationships, substance abuse, arguments. Um, and so then that's just, I kind of repeated the pattern. So I just attracted what I just came out of. And because that's, again, that's what I saw. That's what I developed. And, and, and you could go two ways with it because Garen came from a home that had alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and he went the polar opposite. He's like, I will never touch those things. I came from a similar environment and I was like, oh, that's just what's normal. So that's, and then that's how I came to be. So Garen for me was the first person that I was like, wow, this is what a healthy functioning relationship feels like. Or how did you know? And, and did you do a lot of things to prepare yourself for something like that? Were you actively seeking something like that or did it just sort of happen? Yeah, I call it a quarter life crisis. Okay. <laughs> so I was 28. Uh, so if anyone knows what their Saturn return is, so it's basically a point in time astrologically, if that's something that you believe in or follow, um, where I started questioning my identity. So I questioned everything about how I made money, my identity in the world, my identity with myself, all relationships. And so at 28, so I didn't know that this was called the Saturn return at the time. Um, at 28, I was all of a sudden, I was super confused. I was actually married at the time. At 28, I had an amazing career. I had the house, I had the income, I had the external environment of, I guess you would call success. I was achieving, I was doing well, and inside I was crumbling. It was 
awful. It's terrible. And so I prayed. I said, I, you know, God, show me a sign. Universe, show me a sign. If it's on a bus, if it's in a book, if it's in a movie, just show me a sign of what am I supposed to be doing. <clears throat> and a friend of mine had went to a personal development conference and had shared with me this this new transformation, these new breakthroughs that were happening. And I was like, I don't know if this is it, but I'm, I'm not going to miss it. And so I signed up for it. Which one was it? It was called Mastery and Transformation Training. Uh, similar to Landmark, if you've ever heard of Landmark. Uh, and so I went. I knew nothing about it. I literally packed my bags. I flew to Los Angeles. And I walked in. And I knew who Garen was. I didn't know Garen, but I knew who he was. And I walked in. And you were married at this time. I was married at the time. And I walked in and Garen was there. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? And he's like, I just got done with this course. And then I was like, wow, nobody knew that I was there. And so he kind of became my friend. And after the first week of the training is when I went back and I told my then husband, I think we should be friends. And a week later we filed for divorce and three months later we were divorced. Like, I mean, and, and I, I was like, I knew, like, I mean, I, I knew after that first week it was like, I'm going to blow up my whole life and this is this isn't going to go well externally, but this is kind of life or death for my soul. Mm. And so I, I shed everything that I felt like was untrue for me and things that I said yes to that didn't, wasn't aligned with, with my heart. Cause I was I'm a recovering people pleaser. Um, and so I did, I, I blew it all up. And so, uh, it was very confusing for people that like what you know i thought you were so happy you know your your life looked so great everything looked like it was going so well and it wasn't and through that garen was my my f one friend that was like i'm gonna stand by your side and he really was my friend i mean he heard i mean i ugly cried in front of him i told him s traumatic things that had happened in my life because i didn't care because i was like this this is i had nothing to impress i had nothing to impress of him, like I wasn't looking to impress him. I wasn't looking for anything. He was just the one person that I kind of confided in and kind of walked me through this journey and became my friend. And six months later, I asked him out on a date. And, you asked him out on a date? Yep, I asked him <laughs> out on a date and we went out on a date. And on that date um, is when he told me, he's like, I could see you as my wife and the mother of my child someday. And I was like, wow, I wasn't prepared to hear that at all. Um, and then fast forward, 11 months later, we were married. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about a transformation. <laughs> when you, so that time when you went to LA, mm -hmm. you said you knew of him. Yep. But you didn't know him at that point. Correct. When you first met him, what did you, was there any sort of psychic power like we were talking about earlier? Was there any sort of like reading on that? Or was it strictly like you're, you were about to tear apart your entire life. So there was just nothing. You were just like, oh, this is a human. Yeah. Uh, I actually didn't like Garen. I actually thought he was very arrogant. I thought his energy was so big that it just, I was like, not for me. But I, that was my external judgment because I know who he was. And then when I saw and talked to him, like when I locked eyes with him and I had a conversation, I was like, that was so weird. It Because I had never experienced a conversation with someone where the whole world stopped and I was like in this time warp. Like I've ever seen those movies like where everyone is like frozen, but the two people are like walking around talking and like everyone's paused and like there's a person throwing a dog to a bone and the dog's like leaping in the air, but it's all frozen. That's what had happened with Garen when I talked to him. And I was like that. And all I thought was, I was like, that was such a peculiar experience. I've never spoken to someone like that. That was odd. It was really weird. <laughs> and uh, I, and all of a sudden I was like, he was nothing that I actually expected. Because I thought he was just going to be so full of himself and very into himself. And he was actually very much the opposite. So... Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't resonate with him when I, all these other times. Maybe it was, um, maybe that was my way of deflecting. I don't know. I don't know what, what it was. I never thought about it. Mm, let's 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 take this down a little bit. Let's let's deconstruct that. So, when you were going through this quarter life crisis, mm -hmm. um, the Saturn return, right, and you started to just tear everything down, Phoenix rebirth, right. If there's someone that's like watching right now and probably quite a few is my guess 
um, women are, are going through this type of moment. You built that life and it was beautiful and everyone thought it looked great from the outside, right? And at some point that was the dream. Mm -hmm. It was a life you had built, right? Right. What's the difference between the life you had built and that moment where you decided I need everything to shift? What was like the belief that you had that built that other one and the new beliefs that kind of came in that helped you begin to construct what you're living now and, and where you're going? The life that I had built up to 28, it was kind of like I just picked something and ran with it. And the best quote I ever had or heard was the opposite of belonging is fitting in. So my whole life, I was just trying to learn how to fit in. I was trying to constantly fit myself into these spaces to be liked, to be loved, to be approved of, to be recognized, to be championed for. And so I would try to find all these ways and really, like if I could pan out, I was just looking for all these ways to find love, whether it was through friendships or mentorship or uh, relationships. I just was constantly fiending for, I just want love and approval from people. What I didn't know is what it actually felt like to belong somewhere. And so when I turned 28, I all of a sudden I like took a scope of my life and I was like, none of this really makes sense. Like this, how did I get here? Cause I was really just trying to piece together all these parts to again, fit in. And what I longed for and what I had think what I always truly wanted was to belong somewhere. Because when you belong, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to do anything to be there. You just be long. You belong there by being who you are. I always give the example like soul came into this world and we just love her because she's a being that came into the world. She didn't do anything. She just arrived here. She belongs here. She didn't have to achieve anything with me. She didn't have to prove anything and we just love her whereas I felt like my whole life I had to be something in order to be loved or receive love or fit in or approval or what have you and then at 28 all of a sudden I just didn't care I said nothing feels good the way in which I work feels good these relationships these friendships where I even am living didn't feel good and all of a sudden I was like none of it makes sense that I'm about to blow this up but but what are my two choices? Keep living this life that's crushing my soul or blow up this image that I created of someone that I'm, that I'm not. So I created this outward image of somebody that's not even me. And so I'm fitting in everybody else's world versus belonging even to myself. And so that was a risk I was willing to take. I had no idea how it was going to go. Uh, but to me... Th that one was bigger than the one I had created because I just didn't know. I, I mean, I moved out when I'm 16. I, you know, there's no real example. I had no real um, positive role models. I didn't even know who I was really. And then when I kind of panned out again, then I was like, wow, what am I actually? Who am I actually? What are my ways of being? What makes me feel good? What doesn't make me feel good? And then I just... I took a, I took a bet on that. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So you blew up the marriage, right? Yep. What else did you re-engineer during that time period? Everything. The way in which my business was constructed. Mm -hmm. um, so what was it before? And then what did you do differently? Just in way in which that it worked. Like, I mean, it was so much like I did everything. I was in such control. I made all the choices. Like it was 100%. Like I felt like. I would just do, 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 do versus how, you know, many helping hands make light work. What would that look like if I became one of many versus the one forging ahead? And so I just, you know, I started asking questions. What do you want? What do you think would work well? I started taking input. I take less control. I started stepping back. I started delegating roles. I started empowering people. I started leveling up leadership. I started creating promotions. I started doing all these things that didn't rely on me. So then if I left, this whole thing would be a fully functioning organism, hopefully without me, 
versus the other way around. Because it, it was really much like I had all the balls in the air versus how can I juggle a few while a bunch of juggling are few so we can have a lot more balls in the air than only the ones that I can hold. What was the relationship like with your parents at the beginning of this rebirth? Um, at 28, I think it was really still feeling like I had something to prove to them. Like I had to prove my worth. I had to prove that I, that I'm always going to be okay. I had to prove that I'm always fine. <clears throat> it was just a constant proven, proving it. And, um, I just shared with them that I was, you know, I shared my vulnerabilities. I shared sadness. I shared where I was. And that in the beginning, they were concerned like with my mental health. They're like, is she okay? And cause I had never exposed these things before. And I was trying to create connection and relatability through vulnerability. And then finally I just said, you know, I just, I just really want you to love me. Like, I don't, I know you might not know what to say. I know you might not know what to do. I'm not even asking for any of that. I really just, I just would love for you to love me. Mm. And I remember my mom said, well, I do love you. And I said, I know you do. I need you to say it. She's like, well, I don't feel like I need to say it because you just know. And I was like, right. And right now I, I just, if you could just tell me that you love me, that would mean everything. So I like had to ask for what I wanted versus being so upset and disappointed that I never got what I was looking for. Would you say that that might be the real secret of what you changed during the Saturn return is asking for what you wanted instead of fighting for what you wanted? Yeah. What an observation, huh? Hmm. Yeah. And asking for what I wanted and being okay that if what I wanted wasn't the approval of what everybody else thought I should want, because that was really it. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to upset people. Oh, I'm not, you know, like I'm going to remain in pain and misery because I can handle it versus like, that is total crap. Like that is, doesn't feel good. And yeah, I absolutely lost friends along the way. I absolutely lost, um, yeah, just different types of relationships of people that didn't agree with the route I was taking or didn't, couldn't relate to me anymore, didn't understand. And again, I just constantly thought I was like this, th if you choose their approval, you're going to remain in this spot and I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not a bad person. I'm not screwing anybody over. I'm not nothing in me is malicious. I'm just, that's just not the way I'm going anymore. So I was like, I, I get to be okay with that. And it, and I did a lot of time questions like, am I a bad person for wanting this? Am I a bad friend? Am I, yeah, am I, am, is anyone going to like me? And I just had to continue to be okay. And just like, have you ever seen that poster of, there's like a little girl kneeling in front of God and he asks, he asked the little girl if he could take her teddy bear and behind his back, he has a way bigger teddy bear behind him. Mm. And what I got from that image is basically like, give me this teddy bear that you love so dearly, having faith that I'm going to give you something better. And I just like would constantly remind myself, like if my heart is taking me here, this is true intentions. And I just have to be okay with what's about to happen along the journey. I'm assuming during this time, where you were changing everything, you developed some sort of system, like you just mentioned, of knowing which things were coming from your heart and which things were just you going a little bit insane. Mm -hmm. How today, as an example, when you are thinking of things like this, how do you ask for or filter through like what's very real and very true for you versus anything that's coming from mixed sources? Uh, oracle cards are a big part of my daily practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I love oracle cards. Um, and every time, it's it, that's without fail, I get, I get the exact message I want to hear or that I don't want to hear. <laughs> I get the message. And so uh, it just helps me to process my thoughts. And that spirit or universe is always there with me. And even if I don't make the, the choice 
in my highest concern or um like in my high, the highest version of myself or the the highest outcome for all people including myself that I'd never failed I just get to redo it until I get the outcome that just best serves and so I've taken a lot of tests over before and also to just to get into the path that I know is in alignment to my highest good and to the highest good of all um and yeah so oracle cards have been huge um journaling's been huge I write these things called FU letters um so maybe you've heard of them but when I'm when I am so emotional I can't think straight and so I just write out all my emotions on this piece of paper and it's very non-personally developed thoughts feelings writing and I just write it out and I write it out and I write it out and then I rip it out and burn it I don't read it because then that would just bring it back into my energy so I'm trying to get all the energy out so then I can think clearly and generally when I'm coming from a place of neutral I can tell within my body in which is the best best decision for me which sometimes takes some work to get to neutral and I know you're big on traditions mm. and you mentioned that with baby soul on day mm -hmm. four when if we go back in time to when you mentioned that where you saw her and you saw Garen and you were like, oh my gosh, I am so in love with this life. I'm so excited about the memories and the traditions that we're going to do together. So it sounds like these FU letters are a little bit of a tradition. The mm -hmm. Oracle cards are a tradition. I know the Sunday, what is it called? Your love meeting? Yep. Sunday with, love meeting. Sunday love meeting is a big tradition. Are there others? Because I'm, I'm finding so much value in all yeah. these because like your Oracle cardness mm -hmm. translates to me as like spending time considering big questions mm -hmm. and spending time reflecting on whatever the card shows up as. Yep. Regardless if they're true, right. right? It's just opening up a line of questioning that is much bigger than what should I eat for breakfast, right? right? And reflection, yeah. Absolutely. And the FU letters is like really just being able to say all the things that are raw mm -hmm. so that you can then come to a place of like, okay, I said all the raw things. Now, what does that really mean? And again, you're, it seems like you have a lot of traditions of spending time yeah. kind of chipping away yeah. at the message to get to the energy underlying. It yeah. seems like all three of those traditions are that, right? Mm -hmm. Are there other ones that you incorporate on like a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis? Yeah. Uh, I work out daily. Uh, for me, it's just, it's the movement of the energy. Um, so I, it, it, I can process a lot out. It's very cathartic for me. Like I'm literally sweating them out. Like I have 45 minutes, like I will purge all these thoughts. And I also come up with some of my best thoughts while I'm working out. So working out is a huge thing for me. Um, and then also walking my dog. I know it's so minuscule, but I don't take any electronics with me. I don't take my phone with me. I don't take earphones with me. Um, Ever? I would say once I become conscious of this, um, I would say that this is, this is pretty habitual that I don't, I, I don't take electronics with me because that's the time where I just, again, it's, I'm not necessarily in high intensity when I'm working out, but I can actually walk and pay attention or it's meditation and movement. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best like sitting down and meditating for an hour. Uh, and I realize as I've created practices that meditation, and that's just, I'm doing essentially the same thing because I'm, I'm paying attention to the trees or the birds or the dog or I'm just being while I'm walking and essentially you're doing the same in meditation um, versus with sitting with my eyes closed. Both are beneficial. Uh, I just feel like sometimes um, when I have so much energy like coursing through me that it's, it's not as conducive to sit and meditate versus walk and meditate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's another tradition. Uh, quick question about that. So clearly you exercise a lot. You are seven months out of having a baby and mm -hmm. you look like you've had no babies, ah, right? Thank you. So when it comes out to working out every day in your experience, because I also know you're like, I have many questions that we're going to go down the rabbit hole of like leadership and like yeah. how you help other people yeah. do these things for themselves. 
Do you have like any particular advice on getting into a consistent daily exercise practice? Mm -hmm. Like what would be your biggest tips on that? I feel like everyone always is like, what do you do? What What is your workout plan? I was like, well, what, what brings enjoyment for you? So if it's walking, walk. If it's yoga, do yoga. If it's CrossFit, do CrossFit. If it's, you know, walking on the beach, walk on the beach. Like whatever that thing is for you, like, because then the odds are you're going to do it. So like I remember I joined a, um, like it was a, a Pilates class and I just realized that Pilates was just not for me. Uh, but I did it for 30 days and every single day I dreaded going and I dreaded being there and I was so grateful to come home. And so I didn't get enjoyment out of it. And again, nothing against Pilates. It just wasn't for me. Uh, so I, what brings you joy? What do you feel like you can do? Um, and for me, a lot, a lot, my, my greatest success in fitness has always been in group fitness classes just whether it's a crossfit class whether it's a yoga class where i know people because i walk in the door and people are so excited to see me or i'm so excited to see them or on the weekend we would stay after class and chat with each other go to brunch with each other so creating a community in the fitness area so mm. that'd be my biggest advice do it do what you enjoy and um if you enjoy yoga, maybe you can find a community in yoga where you can go with people, meet people there, go out to eat after with them, whatever. All of the community things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then are there any other traditions that kind of pop up? Things that you do at regular intervals or, yeah. Regular traditions. So I call it my big three. So I try to do a big three every day. So it's my article cards, journal and meditating. They're kind of the same. And then working out. So if I can do those, the big three every day is like, ah, uh, and then I would say 75% of the time I do two of the three, which I'm always like, yes, I crushed it. So the goal is always three. And if I don't get all three done, no problem. So during, usually it's always the Oracle cards. It's usually always working out. And then I usually do one of the two, either journaling or meditating. And if I can do them both, that's like the extra so those are my traditions beautiful mm -hmm. so garen your husband is a pretty wonderful person yeah and obviously he's very well known mm -hmm. he he's just awesome yes. right what do you think he does that attracted you to him mm -hmm. what do you think is like what does he do very well that you think because it's this whole conversation right of like he attracted you to him and you attracted him to you, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think on his side of it that you've noticed um, in the very beginning? And then I'll go further with other questions. There are very few people in the world that do things with their whole heart. Mm. Like his, his whole heart is there. And it is, he brings the world joy by being joyful, by bringing joy to himself. And so it's a curious thing because I feel like we, the, my experience has been adults don't know what that's like. I feel like we get into it. My experience, again, my experience is like we get into a mundane routine. Like we get up, we have coffee, we go to work, we come home, we watch TV, we go to bed. When rinse, wash, and repeat. And it's very autopilot. It's very mundane. There's not a lot of excitement. It's very not elaborate and garen will find joy in the most mundane things like you walk into our house and he's in the shower the man is singing at the top of his lungs he's folding laundry and he's beatboxing he is doing the dishes and he's dancing he is changing baby soul's diaper and he has hit the exact same song that he sings every time he changes her diaper we go to the grocery store and we when we go to the grocery store we'll do push-up challenges because one of us will grab out our phone and you go push-up challenge and you have to do 10 push-ups in the aisle and so we get we kind of play a game when we go grocery shopping so he just finds way to bring joy in the smallest and simplest tasks that you do i would say in everyday life um and he's unapologetic about it. Like he's just so free. And I feel like people get so much joy watching this person be free 
because then it unlocks something when within themselves like gosh I wish I could do that and then you know his answer and my answer always is you can it's just the choice whether to do it or not so um yeah he is a a very joyful soul to be around and what would you say about yourself what was so special about you that attracted him to you uh i'll use his words so when we met like i was so curious about him like i was just like how does this person just have so much fun all the time and they're so successful and they're so magnetic and like i didn't nothing about him made sense i was like this this is not computing in my brain he's very outer worldly and spiritual i'm very linear linear and logical like I, i understand systems and structures and flow and you 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 can't just manifest things like you have to work towards them and this is my mentality and so garen was such a phenomenon to me that i was like what is this and also probably why now that i'm thinking about it what repelled me from him because he was so foreign and so he would tell me to do things and i would just i would do them i was so i was so like i want to learn all of these things that you have created and done and he he's always like i just have never met somebody who is so eager to learn and so quick to apply and he goes not only would i apply i would get a result and i would come back and tell him i would like here's what you told me to do here's exactly how i did it i actually created a powerpoint about it here are the results i got <laughs> and here's the powerpoint in the event you ever want to train this if you have another me in the audience because they might not understand your outer worldly analogies because he's a whole world of analogies they might just be able to follow a linear system with some stories in it and he's like wow thank you so i think we both were so fascinated with how we worked um that it was just this constant like evolution of each other because we were so different but so many ways that he helped me elevate and so many ways that i support him in elevating it was just we we're constantly showing each other our blind spots and we're like whoa i didn't even know that was possible or wow i never thought of it that way versus like so shut off to what because we were so different from each other mm. so i'm going to take another hard right turn and then come back to this i have a belief and through experience that women who have tough relationships specifically with their fathers and i'm i'm you're an exception to this and i want to figure out why and i want i want to see what your wisdom is on this that if they have a tough relationship with their father it'd be very hard to have a loving relationship with a partner mm. clearly that is not the case here can you tell me why i think the more that i've just had like learned about myself like you know i, I did the inner child work about things that i didn't get when i was little the the love that i fought for the trauma that i went through the alcohol the alcoholic parents the abuse the more and more that i just learned and i uncovered the more and more i had compassion for my parents i mean my parents i ha- i have so much compassion for my mom and dad my dad's one of six you know he when he was 6 years old he worked on a farm and he never spent one in summer his entire from 6 all the way till 18 with my grandparents because they sent him to a farm because my grandma had four other kids at home or three other kids at home and my mom the moment they found out my mom was pregnant uh with my dad um they kicked her out of the house no financial support mm. nothing and so my parents you know my dad had two kids at 21 one with my mom one without and then they were on their own 19 and 21 with two kids mm. they're two kids so you have a ton of compassion and so they really like i mean they really did the best of the cat and or but it's best that they could so the best way that i can describe it is i feel like my parents have an an emotional and life i don't want to say cap i feel like they have capped themselves at a certain certain exposure consciousness awakening belief um something they got to one certain point and i surpassed that point 
that I look at life a lot differently. I look at the world a lot differently. I look at the way in which I was raised. I look at future lives, past lives, astrological lives, reincarnation, karma, so much differently. And so with that, I've been able to love my parents in a whole new way. Um, And my parents are the exact same people as they were when I was 16. So what's different is myself. And so I just, and and it's a lot of work, right? And I I still get triggered and still things things come up because it's a embodiment experience. Like I'm triggered back to when I was 12 or I'm, it's, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's like a muscle memory almost that that comes up when my dad says something. It's almost like, oh, it's still in there because it's just a whole rewiring. And I'm so grateful that I have the tools to consciously know that. So when Garen triggers me, it's not necessarily Garen. It's like, whoa, what is this within me that I'm still working through? And so Garen and I have developed this thing um, I don't know if he ever he talked about it, but so let's say we get in some type of disagreement, argument, what have you. We always have the line, I say, time out. Can we redo that? So we could be in the middle of an argument. It's so intense. And I'll literally go, time out. Can we redo this? We literally will go back to before the argument started mm. and literally replay the entire thing all the way up until somebody got pissed. And then in that moment, one of us has to say something different or do something different hopefully then to have a different outcome of the argument if that makes sense Mm. and so we literally and we both will play full out like it's like we got out of the car we came inside we kissed we started making a tea and then someone said something and someone got triggered and then 20 minutes later we don't even know our argument anymore and so then we literally will go back go back in the car, we'll get out of the car, we'll come inside, pretend that we're making tea. You'll physically do all the things? physically do all the things. (laughs) That's so cute. Whoever said the thing that triggered the other, then we literally go and we create a new outcome, which for me has been so healing because if I was 12 and someone just would have said, Blair, what is it that you want right now? Like, there's just things that I'm like, Aaron, I need you to say this because no one ever said that to me. And I just need you to say that so I can give you a different answer. What do you, okay, so let's say you're both busy, mm-hmm. right? You got a lot going on. You have a seven month old in the other room, right? Mm-hmm. You've got a dog. You've got people coming in and out of the house all the time and you're really busy and something like this happens. Does someone ever just concede and they're like, you know what? I like you can just win. Mm-hmm. Is that a thing, or do you? Is it like really like eat to? If there's something on the schedule that someone needs to go do, will you still be like, no? Now we have to break the schedule and we need to deal with this before someone goes and does their interview or whatever they're doing. We call it parking lot. So we uh, one of us has to stay. We're parking lot in this because I cannot brush things under the rug, and I also don't want to win. And he doesn't want to win either. Mm. I was like, I'm, I'm frustrated because we're frustrated with each other. Mm. And so we'll parking lot it. And it will literally, this argument is waiting in a parking lot. But then I'll literally, like our whole, <laughs> I don't know how we do that, but our whole energy will change. I'll kiss him. I'll love him. And it's like it never even happened. He goes to his interview. He comes back. Aww. And there has to be some type of grace period. So it's like, we're parking lot this by 7 30 tonight we're going to come right back to it so you establish that right out of the gate so we know exactly when we're coming back to it yeah so then i get my husband back and he gets his wife back and it's like nothing happened because at the end of the day i love him more than i love the argument i just need the argument figured out because it's getting in the way of me loving my husband so i'll move it to the side so we can figure it out later and we can get back to what we're doing however the agreement is we come back to it so it can we don't have any unfinished business Incredible. I love that. Okay. So let's talk about the the busyness thing again. Mm -hmm. And let's let's go to like scheduling and in beyond that leadership, right? So I have a question for you. I already have a partial answer to because you've alluded to it, which is from what I know about you, Mm -hmm. not directly from you, you're a phenomenal leader of people. And you kind of mentioned this twice before. One of the things I was going to ask you is like, what are your pro tips or wisdom 
on helping other people become the best version of themselves and leaders within your business mm -hmm. and also just within their lives. I'm, I'm presuming you, you do this with friends as yep. well because it's just a part of who you are. You're doing it with Garen all the mm -hmm. time and I want to get into that. That's a really, I really want to get into that. <laughs> so, but when we, you talked about like with Garen, right? He gave you all this advice and wisdom, but in his own language, in his mm -hmm. own way. Yep. And not many people can necessarily interpret that as well as you did, mm -hmm. which is obviously why you're drawn together. Mm -hmm. And then you broke it down into very manageable steps. Right. So that other people could apply it in the future for him as well. And yourself, I presume you do that with your team as a leader. You help them kind of see what's great about them and what they're actually doing to make yep. things work. What are the other things that you do to help other people become the most incredible version of themselves? So just in like, how, how could you structure your day? So you're 80% of your day, you're in your strength zone. So it's like, how can I be 80% of my day? I'm doing things that I'm really, really, really good at. And the other 20% of my day is like some of the things that have to get done that rely just on me. It's not necessarily my favorite. It's not necessarily my strength zone. However, these are things that I get to do because they're commitments, they're responsibilities, it's insert whatever. So I try to figure out how do I also put people in a position that they're in 80% of their strength zone. How do we establish what a strength zone is for a person? Like first for ourselves and then maybe how do you help other people navigate that? I think it's, well, personality type, like what are things that you love to do? Like there's, there's, you know, there's different type of learning to, you know, there's visual, there's audio, there's example, whatever the other one is. But I try to figure out ways in which people, when they're in group groups, like what is their personality that they, what do they bring into the table? So then you get people like Garen or yourself, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. Where they're phenomenal at most things. Yeah. How do you help? Because there's levels to this, right? So then what's stage two? What are they most passionate about? Mm -hmm. So Garen is so talented at promoting, at developing, at transformation, and he's passionate about people. Well, I can do all those things. And I also would be like, well, I also am extremely talented at creating a system, a flow, or a structure, and I can create the directions. So Garen, I need you to go out and promote this to the people. And then I'm going to present to them the how to, to the people. And then, so it's like, what are the personality types? Generally people gravitate, you know, people are really excited or people are really organized or people have spreadsheets or people are very caring. And so basically uh, in the quadrant, that's the position I'm going to put them in. Well, if people are really excited about spreadsheets, I'm not going to go ask them to go rally a bunch of people in the crowd. One, because they might not be very good at it, and two, they probably don't want to. So to me, regardless of where you are on the positional part of the leadership, doesn't really mean anything to me. Like, where am I going to put you in a position to win, and where are we going to put in a position of the people in that we're trying to support and impact? What is the biggest impact that we're going to create based on your contribution? So I don't believe in positional, in John Maxwell talks about positional leadership. Um, that's not necessarily how I roll. And he talks about in the, that in the book. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I've kind of working with when, work, when working with a large organization. What are you most passionate about? I love finding the gap and creating a solution. What's not working? What do we need? what is missing, what is what is too complicated, and I love creating some type of solution. Uh, I feel like one of my personality types is, is, I had a mentor tell me, she's like, you have more ideas in a day than most people have in a lifetime. And so I was like, okay, that's a skill set I didn't even know I had. So how do I take the skill set and then apply that to an arena to support other people? What At what age did you start recognizing that and actively doing that? Oh, man, ever since I was little, my mom was just like, you know, you're so observant or you're, you, you can color, you love playing sports, you can sing, you ride horses, you can build a garden, you can paint. And so I just love doing all sorts, because all things just fascinate me. I'm a, I love learning. I'm, I love learning. Um, my issue is, is I try to learn too many things at once. So I try, I'm working on channeling the arena, mastering an arena, 
a little bit before I move on to another. In the last seven days, what are the most joyful memories for you? Uh, yesterday I went over to a friend's house and she was talking to me about ways in which to strengthen my intuition. And so she had given me three practices. So one was called lucid dreaming. One was offerings to the land to just like take a moment to be present, to offer something to the land. And then another one is to get a specific card reading with someone to support me in strengthening my intuition. So that's been one. Um, the second one is watching baby soul try new things. So right now we just started eating solid food. So when she gets something for the first time, it's literally the first time. So she had a raspberry for the first time and I had so much enjoyment. Like this human is trying a raspberry for the first time ever. Like, and so when I ate the raspberry, it was like, this where did this raspberry come from and the taste and the smell and the texture like I was living vicariously through this this baby um and then the third thing is is um Garen and I went out to we had a, a random day that we didn't know that we both had off and we took a, a trip to Barton Springs it's a natural spring here in Austin and we brought baby soul there and when we were me Garen and soul were there at the same time and we realized that the last time we had been there was when I was actually pregnant mm. so last time all three of us were there she just was not earth side and then all three of us were there now she was earth side so that was neat that's awesome so in my experience of humans, right? Someone like you who, and Garen, I believe I can quote, he said, you have sexy spreadsheets. Mm, like yeah. you're delicious at spreadsheets, right? And he is clearly not that way. And in my experience of humans, when you take two people in partnership and one is a spreadsheeter and one is not a spreadsheeter at all, singing in the shower, mm -hmm. dancing around all the time, that creates conflict. For sure. Have you in the relationship actively mm -hmm. cultivated like the gratitude and the love for him not being like that and for him sure. likewise yeah so what is going to so this is how i function i'm gonna work on i'm gonna work on sharing how i function in a way in which garen's gonna hear me and vice versa so he he was probably allergic to lists and spreadsheets before he met me but he loves color, he loves fun, he loves visuals. So anything that I do for him has to have lots of emojis, has to be super <laughs> simple, has to have lots of color. And so when I present it to him, and it's really like I'm explaining it to a six-year-old, and Einstein said, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you have no business explaining it. And so everything I do has literally supported me in the simplicity of how to do things because I have, I get to explain it to Garen. Now with that, he has also leaned in to going, okay, I know that this is how she, you know, how am I going to communicate with her in a way that she'll hear me? So then he'll start making lists or like, so we kind of lean into each other's, we kind of have to cross paths and lean into how we both speak to each other. So things that I'll also lean into is when I know I have a jam packed day and I have a lot of things going on, I will intentionally find time to take five minutes to have a random dance party because he will be delighted elated that I found five minutes and I, that I initiated it. And so um, things that he'll do with me is I love sitting at the dinner table and eating. Um, I, I, he also just, he's the guy that grabs something out of the fridge, eats in it while he's basically in the fridge and then goes on to what he's doing next. So he'll carve out time and go, oh, I'm eating, I'm eating lunch in 10 minutes. Are you available? I'm like, I will be available. So I think that it's just important to like, I'm not fighting to be heard. How can I be creative enough for Garen to hear me? Mm. Which I think is very similar, but very different. Yeah. So clearly you're both like a 10 out of 10 amazing. <laughs> the 11 out of 10 is what I'm curious about. Are you two just intuitively doing all these things and talking about these things and the combination of your freak genius 
is just creating these routines and habits or are you working with people that are helping you cultivate these appreciations for each other's differences like how is this happening yeah so right when we were probably dating for about three months and we knew that like this was our person i also knew that i had a lot of stuff that i still wanted to work through individually and i was garen's first really um i would say serious relationship so we have a term that it's like we're not each other's halves we're both whole individuals and because two halves make a zero two holes make infinity so we knew we had individual stuff that we really wanted to work on uh, and we wanted to work on them individually together at the same time so we actually worked with a spiritual slash relationship coach that really helped us understand our woundings and what was happening and our triggers and and we worked a lot through that so we actually worked with the same couple their name is jan and monica zanz and we worked with them from three months of dating and all the way up until baby soul was born so two years um and that really catapulted a lot of um a lot of our communication then from there i would say you know, like kind of like I shared with you, I love to find the gaps in my business that aren't working and how can I fill them? I'm constantly doing them in our relationship. Um, and we've established that in order for things to work, there gets to be like an active, someone that's actively passionate about it and an active participant. So if I'm extremely passionate about date night, Garen's like, I might not be passionate about date night, but I'm going to be an active participant in my wife's evolution of this. And I might not be so excited about all of these community events that my husband wants to go to, but he's passionate about them. So how can I be an active participant in that? So I don't know if that kind of answers your question of how we do a things. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I'm going to rewatch that clip a few times. I have a friend, uh, Jeffrey Allen, and him and his wife are also like you and Garen, actually very similar personalities. So it's interesting and she says life and she's japanese she speaks very little english but she can say this one line and i was like what is what is life really about and she is a straight angel walking on earth and she says make happy memories mm. that's like the thing and i think i've found that to be pretty consistent across all the amazing people that i get to sit down with and interview like this mm -hmm. and i feel like that's what's coming through really strong from yours that's also my bias and perspective yeah. coming into it but i feel like everything you've been talking about is is that you know, it's like eventually getting to the point where you make more happy memories with Garen, with Soul, with your team, with mm -hmm. Dobby, right? With everyone that's around you. If we were trying to help other people make more happy memories in their life, hi Soul, <laughs> then what do you think you know that's helped you create so many of them? It really is the cliche like this right now is the only moment we have. And so... There are times my husband will ask me to dance and I'm putting away dishes and I fight to put away the dishes because that's what, what I think should get done so I can check it off the list. And through time, I just realized I'm not going to remember the dishes being put away. I am going to remember this dance with my husband. I'm not going to remember how much laundry there was. I'm going to remember watching Soul Crawl for the first time. And so I just constantly put myself in a, like when I look back at this lifetime and all the pictures that we take, like in that photo, I want to go back to that feeling of like, I remember how, oh my gosh, do you remember how much fun we were having, how free we were, how exciting that was, how much, la how much we were laughing. And so that's why it's so crucial for Garen and I I feel like to get through the small stuff because it's all so small, like, does it really matter? Like I, and this is the part that I probably think about too much. Like I only have 60 years left with my husband, you know, and that's on the high end. I only have 60 years left and I don't know how he's going to come back. I only have, you know, 70 years with soul. And so what do I want that very small amount of time in the scheme of eternity to be? And so 
when I when that came up when she was four days old, everything became so minuscule. Like, what's the point of this silly argument that you didn't put away your clothes or that you always I trip over your shoes every time I walk in? It's annoying as hell. And in I get 60 years and I'm so grateful I tripped over your shoes for 60 years because that's just who you are. So it's just, it's that. It's it's such a small pocket of time in the scheme of eternity. And I love him so much and I love her so much that I don't, it's a waste of time to not be in so orgasmic joy adventure with each other. I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. That was beautiful. It answered like the next two questions I had in my brain too. It was wonderful. So as a two things number one are there like you are just a well of wisdom and knowledge what's your top recommendation number one recommendation for either book podcast or workshop maybe one of each whatever comes up for you Mm -hmm. that people can start going down the road to to take in more of this information that that you're just throwing everywhere it's amazing uh, the book that really changed my life was The Ten Distinctions Between Milli- Millionaires and Middle Class. Uh, it was the first time that, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in a very blue collar family. You know, like if you had insurance, like you made it in life. Um, and so t- to understand there's a different way of looking at life was the first time someone could break it down in a really simple, logical way. And then, you know, I I understand that millionaires want freedom and middle class wants comfort and, you know, anyway, so I could go on and on about that book that I was like, my whole life of wanting more for myself wasn't selfish. It just was the ability to look at life in a different way, to experience a different type of quality of life and also to have more options because I had the financial ability to do that. Um, I mean, Garen has, has done an abundant of healing for me. Um, and I have been, you know, so I'm grateful that he's my husband and I'm, he's an amazing facilitator. So I live with that every day. And sometimes I have to shut him off. Like, Hey, I'm your wife today. I'm not a student and I'm not a client. Like you get to talk to me as your wife and you get to be my husband. We're on the same playing field. However, um, I have had lots of opportunities to been in workshops with him, which is a can be a shameless plug for my husband, but he he has a way of talking and communicating to people that I've never experienced that I mean he he doesn't do it with just me. He does it with so many people that he just he is a safe space. He's a non-threatening space of a masculine figure who is going to hold you intimately. And so um Anytime I get a chance to be around Garen, like I go watch his podcasts and I learn new things and I listen to interviews. And um, so he has multiple retreats and, uh, and again, not just a shameless plug for my husband, but I've, I've never been in, um, in the presence and someone that's able to do it in the way in which he does. And maybe there are, maybe there are many others and much better ones. I've been around the world. I've worked with a lot of personal development companies. I've worked with a lot of authors and there's a reason that I've been over here twice now to interview both of you. <laughs> and from the moment I met him, I was like, there is something very different here. Something really special about him. It's different. It's different. Mm-hmm. So um, not that he's just my husband, but um, his gift. He has, a, he, has a, he has a gift. So I'm, I would be my, that would be my two. So, and we've kind of covered this in different ways. And, and this doesn't have to be a long answer. As, as your husband, what does he do that, that really helps you feel safe? He grew up with all women. And so he has mastered his feminine and he holds his masculine in a safe, non-sexual way. So it's a like he is an opening a flow i mean he sings and he dances in a way that is so inviting 
and captivating and he is so open and he'll let you go to these very vulnerable places with you and he will hold the sacred masculine the boundary of your safe here and again and I don't know if I've been in a space in which a masculine man has held that for me and it hasn't been with something looking for in the end like that he's looking to sleep with me or he's looking to um that he had an ulterior motive there's no ulterior motive other than I know you've never gone here before potentially with anybody and I'm gonna hold that and I'm gonna hold your hand and I'm gonna I'm gonna get you out of this shit and I'm gonna pull you out and we're gonna go there together and it might be tough for me and you and we're gonna go through this yeah and so he holds that space for me and I've been crazy in that space I've been crying in that space I've been overjoyed in that space and he'll just hold it in an, in this non-judgment I, I that's the best way I can describe it and he's just he is there like he looks into your soul and literally the whole world stops and just is there with me and I can I can and I can go anywhere and the best part, and I, I tell him all the time, like he never holds anything against me. I can say the craziest stuff in this arena and he will never six months, a year down the line, come back and hold it over my head of my crazy or my vulnerable or my, you know, a moment of weakness, whatever you call it. I don't know. Um, he just holds the container and he'll, and as soon as we're done with the container, we just go on with life. Wow. And then what do you think that you actively do that really like stokes his fire and allows him to just be so epic in the world? Being his ultimate teammate, looking for ways I can champion him, I can recognize him, I can cheer for him any way you know like the other day he was having a really challenging time at when he was in the recording studio and he was telling me he's like man i'm really struggling and i was like you've done this and i just name it off i'm like here are all the points of reference to remind you that you have done so many hard things that and you've gotten through it and you felt those that way about all these things and you triumphed so i'm that voice that reminder I'm that cheerleader I'm that champion and also I actively try to find ways to support him in what he's doing oh my gosh have you thought about this in your in your recording how have you thought about this in your second edition of your book have you oh my gosh I heard you do this podcast um I, and you're talking about this lesson what about this story next time so I try to find ways to add value and support him um I try to find ways to think of him when he's, you know, like he comes home and I, oh my gosh, you know, you've been working so hard. I made you your favorite Christmas cookies in the middle of July. I don't Aww. know. I try to do things for him that he knows that I'm thinking of him or that he really, really loves. He has this obsession for $40 pens. Like he, I don't know why. <laughs> and so uh, he lost his $40 pen the other day and I was at, office depot and so i got him two forty dollar pens and so he, you know just things like that that i can find to just continue to fill his love bucket that's awesome mm -hmm. and then before i get into this last bit is there if someone like is listening to this or watching this and like oh my god i love this woman i need to learn way more about her and follow her somehow some way where do they go how do they do that um so well, Garen and I just did a relationships course on GarenJones.com. It was a relationship mastery course. So Sounds I was awesome. Super excited to do that. Just uh, it's a beautiful blend between the two of us. Like Garen has all the stories and analogies in the course. And then I have, I mean, there's downloads and PDFs and workbooks that I was very excited to contribute because that's how my brain worked. So hopefully there was one or the other in the relationship. And also the craziest part, we had more singles sign up for the relationship class and we actually did then then couples because we were like i want to learn how to cultivate these skill sets to call in the partner so mm -hmm. that was really neat um so relationship mastery course on garenjones.com um and then yeah my instagram blair rachel jones 
Awesome. I'll link it below. So the last thing I want to do, uh, invite you to try is when we first started and I asked you like, what's your vision for the future of your life? And you're like, you know, I'm kind of exploring that right now. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to doing an Oracle card <gasps> with that question in mind on camera? Yeah. Cause then we can kind of see how you do that process and how you think about it and talk about it. And yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, so this is my very first Oracle deck. In Ever? Ever. Okay. So it's battered and yes, it's very special. I have quite a few and I always come back to this. So it's the spirit animal Oracle. Um, so near and dear to my, it's like been out in the sun. It's been everywhere. Okay. So we knock the energy out. We shuffle through the cards and I simply just ask spirit or whoever is here, my ancestors, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it. Gaia, Lakshmi, whoever wants to come here today. And I just asked a question. And the question was, is what is the future of my life looking like? And I just kind of meditate on the question. And I just kind of wait. And then I kind of look at the deck and this one's calling me. So the card that I got was the Flamingo Spirit. It says, embrace the in-between. Mm, juicy. But it was upside down. So this is the Oracle message. This is the protection message. And so embrace the in-between, 26. Okay. If you're feeling nervous and wobbly, stop worrying about the past and the future. Instead, be present in the moment, balancing for now is the space in which creativity arises. Creativity is your birthright, but if you're moving too quickly in an attempt to avoid the discomfort of transition, you can blind yourself to the miraculous possibilities that are before you now and those just coming into being. The past has its lessons and, ha and planning has its merits. But right now, you may be imbalanced because you're becoming too nostalgic for what once was or too anxious about what the future might hold. There is time to plan carefully. For now, be still and know that spirit is here co-creating with you in this moment. The next step will appear when it needs to appear. Relax into a state of equ equanimity and balance so an anxiety so any anxiety can transmute into trust and faith that all will be as if for the highest good of all. I think it nailed everything I said. Yep. <laughs> I'm in the in-between and I, I feel that. I feel that. That was wonderful to capture on camera. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one final question. I mean, I've got lots of questions, but we've been going for a while. Can you tell me about your ring? Oh. The wedding ring. Yes. Okay, so diamonds weren't my thing. So this is a blue topaz. So um, I'm really into crystals. I'm really into stones. Um, so blue topaz. So some of the properties are it calms the spirit. I can listen. It can decipher truth through anger or anxiety or the illusion of energy. So um, blue topaz also emits love and connection. And so for me, when I thought of a wedding ring and I thought of what I want to wear every day, what properties do I want to feel every day? So I, it's on me every day. Um, and so to me, a diamond didn't represent my marriage or a wife or a partner in co-collaboration. Um, and this did. So I call it my soul stone because I feel like this was the stone that helps to emit the highest good of my soul. Um, and Garen designed it, so it's custom made by him. And then there's three bands, uh, one for me, one for Garen, and then one for relationship. So co-creation, God, spirit, universe. So us as one. And the one is the biggest one that goes into the ring. So that's what it means. Oh my gosh. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. I'm so <laughs> glad I asked. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. I, I'm honored. Honored to have had this conversation and learn all these wonderful things. And I have many more questions. I'm sure we'll get into at some point. Well, thank you for having me. It was an honor and a pleasure. My my husband is very much the star of the show. And I'm, I'm grateful to contribute parts on the other side as well. 
It is interesting, this idea of co-creation, because now I, I am recognizing why you two work so well together after this conversation mm -hmm. and how it's like, you know, it's truly one of these examples that I look up to of like, you are more because of him and he is more because of you. And that is just so awesome to see again and again and again. And I just love like drinking up that energy and like being able to see how that works and be able to hear this other side of everything from you. So thank you for doing that for me. Thank you for recognizing it. But when you ask me how I'm doing on this tour,